I would like to go first of all to, to Pedro. Pedro, you have been the chairman of the subcommittee who was developing uh, the, this hot and uh, humid uh, label. Um, can you perhaps give us um, um, a short um, in impression of how this work was done, uh, what motivated this work and uh, what in your mind are the, the biggest strengths for that? Yes, yes. Good morning. Is working my mic? Yes, it's working. Yes. Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Here, you know, it's Port I'm in Portugal, so in the West, so it's really morning. <laughs> so, uh, but answering your question, so the the motivation was the the needs to have a classification similar to the winter winter season for the summer, because we know uh, that the, the summer is completely different. The, the the heat recover solutions and the design of the units for climate zones need to be different than the units designed for winter seasons so uh, this was more or less the the, the reason that uh, uh, with manufacturers and the Europa of course uh, find to be the the main reason for, for development the 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 energy labeling for summer. Okay, um, and I understood that the so the core item in this in this label is actually the selection software, correct? This is the, this is the part where where the data of the of the uh, the climatic data has been implemented. So every selection software is using those data, and that the, the energy classification now is specifically. Uh, given for the location and the configuration of a product of an air handling unit uh, in, the, in the project where it's applied to. Exactly. So the, the, to be fair, the, 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 the calculations and the labeling, we choose to, 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 to use a, um, a data, a climate data, that would be the same for all of us. And in a easy way to to have it and to, to have a that database a user database we we applied uh, as by database climate thank you uh, pk um, as in in your experience you have been uh, you're, you're looking back on uh, years of work in uh, in the middle east and in india um, what were your experiences in the past with energy efficiency and with air handling units in such climates and such conditions and how such a label makes a difference? Okay, so I visited the data on certain occasions where air handling units were right next to the sea, as humid as it gets. And uh, one of the things that we noticed on one of the sites was that there was moisture on top of the unit itself and uh, the design was done correctly but uh, there were fan coil units installed in that air handling unit room to first remove the moisture that was around it and those were not switched on and so the tv value the thermal transmittance becomes very very important in uh, units which are kept offshore i'm to say you know European units i have seen and we have installed offshore and uh, on islands and things like that and you really need them to be robust uh, so that you don't have moisture ingress on the unit that's part one which is basically the casing but when it comes to the climates that you see uh, right from iraq to kuwait to bahrain saudi arabia oman and uh, uae and why not many parts of India, we have fresh air temperatures which are certainly much higher than what you see in Europe or in Turkey or in in-between climates. And here we are being told that, uh, you know, you need to put in extra ventilation in order to meet the, the requirements, the health requirements which were posed just some time back. People keep pushing up and up the fresh air requirements 
And really, we see in space that unless we push up the health, the, the fresh air requirements, we don't get the desired CO2 levels and indoor air quality. And it is really important that we pre-cool by using methods which are not really compressor oriented. Now, most jobs in these particular regions, if you separate the room load and the fresh air load, you will find that people are having to install huge chiller capacities in order to meet the fresh air loads. And it becomes really part of airside design to incorporate very simple heat exchangers or heat wheels in order to reduce the intake air temperature of air, especially when fresh air is concerned. And uh, it's good to see it becoming a part of uh, labeling, not only in Europe, but around the world. Just like in India, we did studies for six different regions. I can see uh, Silva's presentation where uh, the area one has been defined. And uh, I hope in future people will take more care uh, in order to put in these particular things to reduce the fresh air load up front. And uh, that should certainly form a part of labeling. And uh, that's been my experience with air handling units in all these areas. Thank you, Marcus, over to you. Thank you, PK. Um, then the, the factors, we've heard that the, the three main factors which, which make a, a big impression on uh, energy efficiency would be the energy recovery system, adiabatic uh, cooling and the bypass mode. So see, looking, at, looking at energy recovery, um, Europe uh, has made energy recovery already uh, compulsory, mandatory. Uh, how is that uh, for, for countries in the Middle East, uh, for, for any country in, in hot and humid climate? Shall we, uh, are regulators, authorities advised that they would mandate this uh, like like in Europe that we that we have to use energy recovery. Uh, Sylvain, maybe you can. Okay, um, on this point, um, Europe I, I think is uh, in advance uh, and uh, is really serious in terms of energy uh, efficiency. However, um, uh, even in Europe, um, there were some debates about this uh, because sometimes, and especially for southern countries. Uh, to impose a heat recovery system might not be the best solution in all the cases. And I will uh, uh, let Pedro Lapa explain in details why, because he's, uh, he knows uh, about it very well. So um, already in Europe, it was, uh, there was some debate about him imposing heat recovery uh, systems with a, um, a minimum limits. Um, I think the approach that um, is the, the Eurovent approach is maybe more um, consistent uh, because it's a holistic approach which takes into account uh, all parameters, the air speeds, the heat recovery efficiency, um, the heat recovery pressure drop, um, the fan efficiency, and all these have to be considered. Um, so. If something has to be done, maybe I would suggest that it relies on a method which is more or less aligned with uh, what Eurovent has been doing. And now it is possible to also have a method for hot and humid climate. So uh, I would suggest to these uh, authorities uh, to, to look at this method and maybe to, to get uh, some uh, inspiration. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Pedro, a question. Yes. Um, heat recovery first. How do you see, um, is heat recovery really uh, like, um, one of the main stones for that in hot and humid climates? Yes, so um, what, we are, what we are doing about the, the, I will answer to you, but maybe not so directly as we expect, but give me some time. <laughs> what we are doing in the, in the, in the label, in summer labeling with Europa is, using three different uh, approach because the climate is very different okay for the humidity zones is the ones that we already development uh, and is recover the energy latent uh, 
with with a wheel or, or some plate special plates that are, is starting to to exist so uh, it recovers plates so uh, like that but there is different uh, places too that are not so humidity but uh, are but need to to we we need to to find a way to reduce the energy consumptions in the units okay so when that way could be the indirect the diabatic cooling uh, that would be very useful in dry places okay when the climate is dry so we need to to increase the delta t between the inside and outside so doing the indirect diabatic cooling we promote that and the another solution is is the the bypass mode in the in the heat recover component because as an example here in portugal uh, we we are the, one of the most uh, hot climates in europe but but not so hot we have big uh, middle stations uh, okay so between summers and winter is a big period and in that climate, the bypass is very useful because we, we, what we need is reducing the pressure drop in the units to save energy. Okay? So in the end, when all of them be, be ready and used, will be for sure uh, very good tools for the designers to choose a equipment for the places that are doing the, the, the project. But Mark, the question, I think that I answer it when you when I talk about the rotary, no? Um, I guess, so as I understand it, the, uh, the, the heat recovery, especially through, through uh, uh, rotary wheels, is more uh, related than to humidity. Exactly, yes. Um, do, we, do you have differences in components when we talk about, like when we uh, talk about uh, equipment which should go to hot and humid climates? Uh, do, we, do we need to think about different components, the, the different materials in order to accommodate the, the harsher conditions? Uh, is to me the question, Marcos? Peter, uh, you're, I yeah. think you're. Uh, yes, uh, okay. Uh, I don't. Understand very well the question. Sorry about the constructions of the unit or about the the kind, the type of the rotary. No, the the, the when we talk about the product itself, yeah, so the uh, the air handling unit will be yes. shipped or used in hot and humid climates. Do we need uh, from a manufacturing point of view? Do we need to give different materials, different? Do we consider different components in order to accommodate uh, harsher environments? Is this, does that make a difference on the on the unit itself in in form of uh, materials used or yes. components? Okay, uh, I think that I leave this question for the designers and is and for the 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 environment where the unit is installed, depending if it's inside, if it's outside, close to the sea, far away from the sea. So it's not a direct answer to you, depending of the project, you know. But of course, with, with condensations inside of the unit, need to be we need to take some care about that. Right. But thank you. Okay. I have uh, a question to you, Sylvain, and that is, uh, how do we define hot and humid climates? Uh, what are the thresholds for that? Um, what temperatures do we look at? What humidity levels do we look at? When we say hot and humid, what what does that mean? Okay, uh, that's uh, that's a, a tricky question. I don't have the figures in mind, but um, basically there are three main three criteria that uh, were used to define if uh, um, a location is in subgroup one. We take into account the dry uh, temperature, uh, the humid temperature in summer, so the maximum uh, that you could have. But also, also we look uh, at the, the winter conditions. If the winter conditions are quite uh, high, uh, we could say that the, the unit could go in this uh, subgroup one. So um, it's defined in our reference document. Uh, uh, what are the, the specific uh, figures? Uh, I don't have it uh, in mind right now, uh, but uh, basically there are three criteria that are taken into account in order to, to make sure if a location is uh, in this uh, subgroup one. Mm -hmm. 
Do we do we test it according to uh, a specific temperature set point? No, no. Uh, well, yes. Um, basically, the the European standard is um, uh, defining some uh, some temperatures that are um, that are defined. Uh, so uh, yes, there, there are some uh, standard conditions that are that are used for for this uh, for this test. And do you know them by heart? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe Pedro, you can help me on, on that one for for the summer conditions. You so <laughs> when you said that it's a tricky question, is it a really tricky question because there is a lot of uh, people trying to define where is humid and not humid. So uh, yes. when when we did this 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 uh, this job, we starting to try to to find. We we read about Copen uh, Copen work um, that is a, a, a Copen Geiger climate. Uh, so he tried to to make a map where is the zones and did it. But in the end, what we used was a, a temperatures and dew points uh, temperatures to define uh, the, the the place to. To be used uh, humidity humidity recover okay so but answering to you that you ask me the temperatures let me look I have to to, to check in the documents give me one second please so the 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 labeling the labeling system as now because we are only with one step the, the humidity recover is for the dry winter is for for the the bowl the temperature dry bowl in summer bigger than 30 de degrees and winter bigger than minus three degrees or the dew point temperature higher than 17 degrees and winter bowl temperature higher than minus three and the last condition is dry bulb temperature higher than 30 degrees and dew point temperature higher than 17. But that is in, in the documents in, in the table that uh, uh, conditions. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for you, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Pique. Um, yeah. One of our one of our attendees uh, wants to know how can uh, air handling units help to reduce or to control relative humidity inside uh, supermarkets in the Middle East? Okay, so what I have seen in the United States is the supermarkets have two separate sections. One is the fruit and vegetable section, and the other is the normal section where you have toiletries and all the other products, household products, and things like that. Now, the household products or the toiletries region is treated exactly like indoor cooling for comfort and say office air conditioning or other things there is no much moisture ingress over there but when you come to the areas where produce is kept then you need to install heat wheels or hygroscopic wheels in order to take the moisture out before it goes into the cooling coil and that is predominantly used over there. I'm sure it has been tried out in some of the carry fours and other supermarkets in the Middle East also. One of the best examples of this that I had seen was in Howard where they had a stadium, indoor stadium, and they had this particular unit hanging from the roof. So if you give me uh, this participant's email ID, I will send him a lot of literature because it's quite detailed on how to handle humid environments in supermarkets in the Middle East. Once again, I really like, I'm just uh, digressing a little bit. I really like what Petro said about the bypass, that there are enough in between regions in any part of the world over here or in the Middle East their outside temperatures are pretty good. You know, cold winter nights, the shamal wind and things like that. 
And that is really the time you don't need all this humidification, dehumidification. The bypass mode is the best working mode. Now, some places, they just stop everything. You know, they say that everything is fine, no need for air conditioning. But in today's environment, when we are talking so much about air filtration, you know, for meeting the indoor hygienic requirements, you have to keep the air on. And at that point of time, it will be the bypass mode that will work. If you look at ASHRAE 90.1, then ASHRAE 90.1 classifies the whole Middle East and India and other places as region zero or region one. And it doesn't, it says, uh, it says economizers are not mandatory. And that's why you didn't see much of economizer operations in the Middle East or in India. But there are specific regions in all these parts which could do very well with the economizer. And even in supermarkets, you know, uh, supermarkets have become 18 hour operation. They are no longer 12 hours and things like that. And comes the winter in Middle East where you have to keep the air on and uh, you don't know what to do. It's much better to bypass all this, reduce the pressure drop, supply the air into the space. And then comes the intelligent controls which are moving in today, you know, Air handling units in time to come will become as intelligent as any other machine and they will kick on different modes as and when required. So I hope Marcus, I have answered your question on this particular thing. Thank you. Um, then another question from uh, the audience. Um, what reference standard is used for the efficiency testing of air handling units of Eurovent? I think this is for you. Yes, the, um, we have a, our certification program for air handling unit um, uh, has uh, what we call a technical certification rules, uh, which defines how the certification program is uh, running. And in this document, uh, we have detailed all the, um, let's say, uh, the system uh, which uh, enables to calculate the energy uh, efficiency classification. So it's a specific, uh, let's say, calculation method which is related to um, the European certification program for air handling units. Uh, but of course, we also rely on testing methods uh, that are uh, referred in European standards. So basically, EN 13053 for air handling units and EN. 1886 for uh, model books. But for AHU energy efficiency classification, it's a specific uh, document uh, made by Eurovent and related to the to the certification program. Thank you. Um, another uh, question from the audience. My question is regarding energy labeling. Low air velocities mean a higher footprint and also higher costs. How do the building owners and regulatory bodies look at it? Well, this is, I think, something maybe uh, PK you can um, try to uh, to to assess. Uh, we, of course, we are not building owners ourselves and regulatory bodies, but let's see what you what what do you think about. See, this is this is where the expertise comes. You know, you separate the hay from the shaft and things like that. You bring out the good versus the mediocre. I'm to say, it is a known fact that low air velocities create less pressure drop. And comes the problem of uh, footprint and things like that. Good designers take this into account. Today, what are we faced with? We are mainly faced with two challenges. Energy and indoor air quality. If you look at the cost, I'm to say you wouldn't you would be surprised to see that a good office building or space in India costs as much as a good office space in France. You know, the prices are the same. And if you are talking about uh, $250 per square feet as the best outer outer cost for a good office building, 
the air conditioning and all these things is not taking more than 10. You know, even 10 is too much. People in US, they used to talk about two and say, I'm going from two to 10. So guys, it's, it's, it's penny wise pound foolish to install small equipment above the ceiling, which you will rip out in three years and send it and again do it rather than be a good designer, provide these particular spaces, these footprints and good equipment installed in a good way in the Middle East and India last 20 years. And so I can take you to air handling units in, the, in Dubai, which are more than 20 years old and they are still there. You know, double skin units, which came from Europe from very uh, renowned sources and things like that and replaced those single skin units and things like that, uh, probably installed in the 80s, you would still find them. So my answer to this would be, go by the low air velocity, find the space. When you look at the overall cost and the project, the life cycle cost, you know, it would come out a winner. And in fact, the next project on globally is going to be on life cycle cost analysis. I'm sure Silva will, and everyone will agree with it, that we will work so much on life cycle cost analysis uh, that, you know, these questions will become a question of the past, but it's a good question, all right. And I hope it's been answered. Thank you. Um, then I have a question regarding um, the conditions. I mean, we, uh, one person's asking uh, specifically about Dubai, for example, you have locations which are on the, on the coast, huh? the, the, the Palm, Jumeirah, where you have a high uh, humidity, but you have also locations which are more in the in the inland uh, on the on the desert side which do not see that uh, high level of, of humidities um, how can we how can we deal with that I mean now we are looking at, at the at the climate data of one city but even within a city it can be very diverse um, I I guess we can only go as close as possible and be as best, try to be as, 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 as best, but we cannot, we can never cover everything 100 for 100 percent. What do you think about that, uh, PK? So, you know, give, give, give the credit to the designers in any part of the world. I would say the local design in Abu Dhabi or Alain or Palm Jumeirah, it has to be looked in by the local designers and say, this is where the question of mandatory comes in. You know, don't mandate something just blindly. The, the, the request for labeling and all these things, good things come from the fact that this is going to do good, not only to that particular property, but to the society as at a large. So if you are designing the same project, say for instance, in Palm Jumeirah and in Alain, Alain is a hot and dry place. You would go for plate heat exchanges. You would go for that system where you had basically some kind of uh, recycled water first, cooling the plate heat exchanger, throwing it out so it does not mix with the fresh air, the fresh air coming through a cooled plate heat exchanger and then getting into space. You know, these are the innovations. And uh, the journey for this particular energy recovery may be quite old, but it, it has received the right emphasis now with increased ventilation requirements. You know, no longer is it good to go and close the fresh air in order to reduce loads. You know, those days are virtually gone, especially in advanced economies or in economies that are willing to take care of these good installations so yes i'm to say i give it to the fact that palm jumeirah and alain it's not the same but all said and done when we embark on the journey we will reach there where we'll be able to distinguish between these two look at india as far as ashray is concerned we are region zero or region one, we are either hot or humid or we are hot and dry. 
but we have areas which are mountain tops which have very good climate and you know we have done the exceptions so having good people on board all across <clears throat> these points will certainly be discussed and thrashed out i hope i have answered the question marcus thank you pk um a very interesting question i'm sure for you Sullivan, but i uh, will give it to to pedro which third yeah. party is more stringent eurobend or hri i guess sorry it's sorry you do it again which which uh, third party certification is more stringent eurobend or hri and uh, that as you are coming from a manufacturer i think you are more impartial to answer the question Eurover for sure. I don't want to go so deep in that question, but Eurover is a much more uh, complete and much more uh, 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 what's the correct word? Let me think. More fair, because our manufacturers what we want is a fair, fair system. Okay, and uh, I believe it. Uh, Eurover is 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 uh, is hard to, to to achieve and to maintain. Uh, so, I think that is what the, the market uh, needs, uh, is a kind of that, but uh, I don't want to, to be an, 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 a route for the other, the other certification, of course, but uh, is, your, is your European, and you know, do you know the, the ones that is saying that European is a lot of standards and European market we fulfill all of them, so it's our way of working a little bit. I think it's always, it's always important to understand each certification program on its own, what it certifies uh, and how to apply it. So I think this is a, uh, a question which, which uh, should be uh, standing and the, the request would be everybody needs to, every designer and every user needs to, needs to look into that very well and understand it. To know what is certified and how how much I can do with the certification. Um, one last question before we come to the end. Um, there's one person I'm currently working in Africa, in Somalia, Mogadishu, and the relative humidity is 72% with temperature of 31 degrees. Is there any advice on how to bring down the humidity and maintain a 24 degree uh, level in a dry warehouse. I guess this is uh, relatively easy to to answer, uh, PK. Yeah, I mean to say, you know, uh, just dehumidifying on the cooling coil is not the best way to bring down the humidity. And so cooling coils are there to dehumidify your air, but you must use something which takes out the moisture from the air before it goes to the cooling coil. And uh, if it is a dry warehouse, it takes time to dry it. And I'm sure the warehouse will require fresh air. You know, it's not that it is uh, a warehouse where which can do without fresh air. If it can do without fresh air, it's a different story altogether. But if it needs fresh air, then whatever fresh air you are putting it, into the warehouse, make sure that that is going out in a proper exhaust screen, which you are using basically to use a heat wheel or to use a energy recovery wheel to dry away that coil on the return path. And the fresh air that is coming is being dehumidified to the best extent by that enthalpy wheel. Try it out. I'm to say uh, I have seen uh, important companies which today manufacture for low humidity regions. You know, low humidity things are going to be very important in the future to come. For places where you assemble lithium and do lithium battery work, it's all low humidity places. So imagine when we get into uh, into cars which are electrically driven 
I have to say, if you are working on lithium and lithium batteries, you will need the same thing as the gentleman in Mogadishu needs. Right? So start looking at alternate technologies. And I'm sure people will say that, uh, can we sort of uh, cool it down to a point and then, you know, what happens to the dew point and again, humidify, dehumidify. The local colleges have to come in. I'm to say every place in the world today has come to a point where not only there is the industry, but there is academia, you know, and academia sitting at one place, say, for instance, in France or Germany or Portugal, can't decide what Mogadishu needs. So you should be able to have a round table or a forum where these kind of questions can come and the round table can keep advising each other and we can all progress. That's my answer, to it, long and short. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, PK. Um, well, ultimate question, uh, Sylvain, is there any limitation on the size of air, air handling units, uh, which we certify like capacity wise, what are the ranges uh, up to which size can we certify? Yes, uh, basically we are limited because we are uh, um, looking at uh, and we are using tests in independent laboratories. So it means that if we want to certify a unit, we have to be able to certify and to test um, this unit in um, independent labs. And so we have some uh, limitations, uh, but basically um, we can test the, the main ranges uh, um, that uh, you can have on the market, which is from 5,000 to 15,000 um, cubic meter per hour. These are uh, certified. For higher uh, rates, uh, it's a bit uh, more difficult, uh, but uh, you can uh, you can rely on the and check uh, with the manufacturers what is certified and what is not. Um, again, uh, the best. Uh, is to rely on certification, third-party certification uh, from an accredited body. But for extreme cases, you could rely, if certifi certification doesn't cover it, you can rely on independent tests from independent labs. And if it's not possible, you can rely on uh, tests in uh, participant labs um, to, um, to get uh, accurate data. Martin, but we are covering the, the large majority of the of the cases, Mark, basically. Can I add something to that question? Okay. Perfect. So, uh, what Silva said was about the the size of the units that could be tested. Okay, but about the units that is certified, the the airflows could be higher because the software is tested. And it's possible to compare the performance of big units with small units is a question of maths and uh, equations. And in the end, uh, it's not test in the lab a huge unit because there are no labs that could uh, do the tests. But it's possible to to have to check the the, the big units. Uh, when I said big, is a really huge unit uh, comparing with the uh, units already test smaller one. I think that okay. is complete a little bit the answer of Silva. Yes, you're right, Pedro. <laughs> then, uh, thank you very much. Um, we are uh, five minutes uh, over our time limit for today's webinar. So I would like to uh, emphasize we have we've received a lot more questions um, for this uh, topic. As we always do, we will uh, share these questions with our speakers, and uh, we we encourage them that uh, that we will provide one-on-one um, -on -one answers to to the people directly. Uh, it would be always nice to have hours uh, for discussion and for for dealing with uh, specific questions. There are some very nice ones, uh, but uh, unfortunately for a public webinar, this is not possible. So. Uh, please uh, give us a few days of time and uh, be sure that uh, someone of the speakers and someone of us will take care that uh, an answer is provided. I also want to uh, stress again that we will uh, make the handouts or the, the presentations available by uh, PDF uh, to 
we download it from the website and we will uh, send a notification to all our attendees once that is uh, live. We also would um, would publish the recordings of the of the presentation on our YouTube channel. However, because of the technical interruption, unfortunately today, uh, we have to figure out how we do that because uh, it makes no sense to to upload a recording when you have such a, a big uh, a glitch in it. So, but we also see that we have received quite a strong interest. So I would even consider that we repeat this webinar uh, on another date, maybe in uh, in a month or so, or one or six weeks, so that also uh, those uh, who registered but could not attend today have the chance to to follow it and whoever is then interested to join us again is uh, will be very welcome to it. I would uh, kindly ask uh, the speakers that uh, you stay with me please uh, until the end of the uh, the webinar so that we can exchange on that and let's uh, move towards the end. I would like to give a brief uh, summary. So we are looking at various factors influencing energy efficiencies of air handling units in hot and humid uh, climates. Uh, the, these are specifically energy recovery, but also in the future, then adiabatic cooling and the bypass mode. Uh, why do we need this dedicated label? I think energy efficiency is, is, is important enough that we have to provide uh, uh, tools to the markets uh, where they can compare products amongst each other. Energy efficiency classification is one of such tools where you can say, okay, you have such requirements, you will get various offers from different manufacturers. And if you are really interested to get the most efficient one or the, uh, a more efficient one, then you can compare uh, the products based on an uh, energy label. If this energy label then is specifically designed for, to accommodate the design conditions of your project, I think it's uh, really helpful. Uh, the benefits, of course, is this comparability but it also saves you money and time when you when you try to figure out what is the best option for you to go with. Um, we have talked about uh, th third party certification uh, as an industry association. I would like to underline this, uh, this message once more. I think uh, independent third party certification is a, a, a major tool in order to uh, improve energy efficiency because it makes the claims of manufacturers transparent and reliable. Uh, it gives you this comparability and you have the chance to not only choose the functions of a unit, but you can also choose then the energy performance. And from a market surveillance perspective, I believe third-party certification is also a good solution. We are talking about a product which is so uh, complex and individual based on the requirements, on the configurations, on the location it's used that it, is, it will be impossible to, to come up with a, with a one-off uh, uh, test which tells you all. So uh, having a, a third or using, making use of third-party certification is also a solution to have a, a form of market surveillance in place if you have a technical regulations for ventilation or for air handling units. With this, um, I would like to uh, highlight that, uh, again our YouTube channels. Please uh, watch out for Eurovent and Eurovent Middle East YouTube channels. We always uh, publish our recordings from the webinars. You will find a lot of more content uh, on those uh, channels. And we would like to uh, ask you to follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, we have uh, three different accounts here, Eurovent account, we have a Eurovent Middle East LinkedIn profile and a Eurovent certification profile on LinkedIn. I would recommend to follow all three of them uh, we use them as our main communication channel, so whenever we have another event coming up, you will see that uh, posted on our LinkedIn.